Trevor Fruit is 45 years old and slightly balding. Good shape, but no six-pack abs. He could certainly stand to shed 10 pounds. I'm not a fan of using facial hair contacts instead of spectacles. We still don't need readers. Michelle, the family's mother, has a little pouch and a well-rounded ass. It's a good look that I personally enjoy. Just your average chick. You would not stare at her either because she is unattractive or beautiful. Also 45. She selects spectacles. She despises any way of shortening her name. The family is completed by their 21-year-old daughter, Allie, a very intelligent college senior. She, like her mother, has gained a few pounds since playing volleyball in high school. She's fiercely independent and outspoken about women's rights. Despite her desire to transform the world, she still depends heavily on her parents. I'm the only one who works, and things have been pretty tight the previous few years. I didn't want to saddle Allie with school debt, so she reluctantly agreed to remain at home. That is not to imply Michelle or Allie do not receive lovely things. They drive pricey luxury vehicles, while I drive an old F-150. Our house has minimal equity since their lifestyle needed to be funded in some way, and home equity loans provided the solution. Our neighborhood is likely a standard suburban enclave. Block parties happen a few times a year. I can't say that anyone has taken a liking to us, or vice versa. It's simply a different method to split up the weekend. We have wonderful relationships with our close neighbors and a couple down the street whose daughter Sally is Allie's best friend. Michaela appeared lost once Allie started college. She had spent so much time with Allie, and suddenly there was a void. Increasing the amount of time spent on volunteer activity did not appear to help. So one night I brought up the matter. Michelle, are you happy? What are you happy with? Your life. You have withdrawn from me and appear to have lost your spark. I miss the time I spent with Allie. I suppose I'm bored. How about we? Is there anything I am doing or not doing for you? We're good. I do not have any issues. What's with all these questions? I only want you to be happy. Perhaps a counselor might assist you in finding a balance, you know, make ideas to lift your spirits. I do not know. I will think about it. There's now a slight chill in the air, so I let it go. However, two weeks later, Michelle began once-a-week sessions with a life coach. Now you could believe I know. I hoped that things would warm up in our bedroom. Well, no. We meet twice a week. Fornicators then. That will be the case indefinitely. I am not complaining. Michaela tolerates my rapid releases and I tolerate her phony orgasms. Are we normal? Beats the crap out of me. I've never discussed my sex life with anyone, nor have I asked my pals to divulge specifics of their bedroom activities. Mark and Cindy, my neighbors to the south, are in their 60s. Mark is more likely to poke an eye out than loosen a single screw. Although Mark is a touch standoffish, Cindy enjoys baking and her oven has helped me acquire more than a few extra pounds. I was next door, working on their Sorna pump for Mark. The part he required had been on back order for four months. This was the first enjoyable weekend day since the park opened in early December. You don't get many opportunities like this, and I was taking advantage of them. The sliding patio door has seen better days. When you push it open, you will hear a scraping noise. I overheard that sound. Unless Michelle returns from her mother's place, it must be Allie. This was confirmed using. I overheard her chatting. He is inside somewhere. His automobile is still here. I haven't seen him in a while, so I'm in the backyard sitting in the gazebo. So have you considered it? I paused what I was doing. Obviously, Allie did not want me to hear this talk. Mom, you are such a dinosaur. Just try. Max. Sally claims he's an animal, but he does his best to make you happy. Perhaps this is exactly what you need to get out of your bedroom. Boredom. What the fuck? Michaela has complained to our daughter that something is wrong with our lovemaking. We've got troubles. Michelle has not mentioned anything to me. Where did all this stuff come from? Still confiding in our daughter. That is absolutely wrong. I know you need to think about it. Look, Dad told me that he was going to murder Bambi next weekend. I will have Jeff invite Max over to the house. He may be skinny, but he has feelings for you. Sally also stated that his pecker is the perfect size for some anal enjoyment. Then a pause as my growing wrath blurred my judgment. Let's get this straight. My daughter is attempting to match up Michelle with a buddy of Jeff. You don't need to do anything, but you mentioned you had never tried anal. And I'm just suggesting that you try with Max. The next delay could have been because I blew a gasket.
The beast and her offspring are planning to end my marriage. What have I done to deserve this? Okay, please let me know. I love you too. Bye-bye. I was very angry. I guess I'm glad I didn't poke my eye out while working on that blasted punk. Throughout the week, things were awful at home. I went out of my way to upset Michelle and Allie. It worked, and I spent the majority of the week in my office or out in the garage. My power tools are now crisp and shiny. I did not postpone my hunting expedition. However, I had someone monitor Michelle's actions, and seeing Allie, Jeff, and a scrawny kid enter the house around midday on set was not a good omen. Allie and Jeff left at two o'clock. The scrawny youngster left about four. When I returned late Sunday, Michelle was dressed in sweatpants and trying to be all hugs and grins. I wasn't having any of it, even though it didn't prove anything. Michelle was seated with her legs crossed and leaning far to the left, which was unusual for her. Somebody is a little tender. Later in the kitchen, Allie sealed everyone's destiny by gently slapping Michelle's ass, and they both laughed with a false cough. I'm feeling heavy in my chest. I hope those idiots I was hunting with didn't expose me to anything. I'll sleep on the living room couch. Michelle purchased it in the morning. I made up a reason to go to the doctor. I'm having difficulty breathing. My manager had no issue with me having the day off. My intention was to pretend to have COVID. That would give me the time I needed to make my getaway. I could afford to take the time off because I had numerous sick days and vacation weeks accrued. That would bring me to our annual Christmas Eve meal. Announcing that you have COVID scares people away. Did I have COVID? That beats me. I'm fully vaccinated and couldn't feel better. My heart is shattered and I want to kill four people, but my lungs are healthy. I checked into an extended stay motel. There's no need for me to live as a poor. Michelle seemed relieved when I said I'd be out of quarantine by Christmas Eve. She had been calling twice a day, along with her children, instead of tipping my hand. I was polite, but I pretended to be sleepy in order to end the call. I spent my time planning terrible vengeance scenarios and preparing a list of adjustments to all of my finances. There are wills, beneficiaries, and emergency contacts. It never occurred to me that I had amassed so many items using those hooks. Apartment hunting was difficult. It emphasized the severity of my decision to divorce Michelle and send Allie into the real world without my financial assistance. Jeff deserved some sort of retribution, and I wasn't sure how to go about kicking Max in the nuts 10,000 times. When you are enraged, you may consider a variety of options. Most of them would land me in jail, which did not bode well for my future ambitions. The idea for hiring an escort to trap Jeff came from seeing a short article on the news about a corporation that was found doing just that to get rid of undesirable employees. That dual-edged blade would also cause a tremendous deal of grief for Allie. Well-merited, I might add. The plastic tree was illuminated with flickering red, white, and green lights. Some highly perfumed pine cones gave it a festive fragrance. We gathered around the dining room table, preparing to begin our Christmas Eve tradition. We have done this every year for the past 23 years. The first two were conducted without Ali. Michaela had been slaving over a hot stove, and now the supper was right in front of us. Normally, this is where a short prayer of thanksgiving would be said. I stood up to speak, but it was not going to be my usual joyful toast. So, Jeff, what do you think about Heather? When I asked Jeff that question, the color left his face. Ollie cast her interested gaze in his direction. She and Jeff have been together since high school. Was there anyone who questioned whether they'd be together 50 years from now? Oxo, too, asked me. Things were going to change, Jeff stammered. Heather, I do not think I know her. Though, come on, Jeff, you know the raven-haired beauty with ruby lips you had fun with last Sunday night while I gave him the thumbs-up sign. Jeff would have jumped off a high-speed train at this point. He followed a politician's blueprint. Deny, deny, I can't remember where that name was spoken, but it was not believable. So, here, let me play this. My cell phone played an audio clip. Okay, Heather, you are great. Do not stop. God, I'm peaceful again. I switched off the recording. All concerns about it being Jeff's voice vanished with the receding audio waves. Ali went berserk. You are a cheating bastard. How can you leave now? Get the key out. Before Jeff could get up, I stood behind him and pressed down on his shoulders, pinning him to his chair. Jeff and I blocked Ali's attempt to scratch Jeff's eyes out. Ali, you are acting like a dinosaur. Michaela, why don't you take your daughter to another room and calm her down? I and Junior are going to have a conversation. 
Mitchell ushered Allie out of the dining room and into the kitchen. Allie's barrage of four-letter curses continued to ricochet off the walls and sizzling serving dishes. It only took a few minutes to explain to Jeff how things would play out. He was to warn Max that if his path and mine crossed, he would forever regret having born a man. Jeff was informed that his cooperation was completely unacceptable, and I never wanted to see him again. His ashen visage told me he was aware of where he stood and his limitations. Options ranged from my possession to his. A manila envelope moved. Jeff agreed to perform one more performance for me. I yelled toward the kitchen. Mitchell, please come back in and bring Allie with you. We are ready to chat. If looks could kill, Allie would have taken Jeff out. Mitchell sat with a puzzled expression. Both had cried. First, let me explain how I obtained the recording. Jeff. Her name is not Heather. I honestly don't know her real name. She is an escort. I should mention that it was expensive. I paid her to seduce you and capture the encounter. There's also video if you want to watch it, Allie shrieked. Daddy, what the fuck? Did you hire her? I did, sweetheart. How does it feel? You know, to get stabbed in the back? Michaela made a small squeak. Allie's gaze flashed towards, then away from her mother. The women were shedding tears. Jeff, do you have anything to say? I activated the video function of my cell phone camera. Jeff rose up, took the folder in front of him, and addressed Michaela Mitchell as a fruit. You were served as he gave the papers to Michaela. I wasn't sure whether Michaela was going to puke or faint. She'd pass out and puke shortly after regaining consciousness. The pine cones could not compete. After Jeff presented Michaela with the divorce petition, Allie tried to console her mother. He quickly exited the house. Allie sobbed gently as the gravity of the situation overtook her, while Allie and Michaela consoled each other in the master bedroom. I directed traffic in front. Allie's Audi, an early graduation gift for finishing in four years, was hoisted onto the carrier and disappeared. Everything from her cherished motorcycle was in a rubbish bag on the front porch. Check. Michaela's Beamer followed shortly after. The difference between the two was that Michaela's belongings had been transferred to a 23-year-old sedan, representing the number of years we had been married. My attorney informed me that I still needed to provide transportation for Michaela to utilize the check with all of our credit cards paid off and canceled. Ali has two, as I was the co-signer. I drank another shot glass of bourbon. Cell phones were canceled yet again. I had to supply Michaela with a phone. Trachoma. It included 60 minutes of conversation time and 100 text messages. Check. Ali received no such consideration. Both still had their iPhone, which had 16 cameras or something like that. Allow them to choose their own plan and pay for it. With a few fast strikes of my hammer, I covered a for sale coming soon sign in the garage. It was planted prominently in the front yard. Can't sell the house yet because Michelle's name is on the title. I just wanted to let her know what the future held for us. Rather, listen to the Christmas music playing in the living room near the tree. I retreated to the basement. Sitting in the dark can be relaxing at times, especially when you hear the bustle above you when people realize that nothing they used to possess is functional. I was called several less-than-Christian names. Those names were gentle in comparison to the ones I'd screamed in my empty hotel room prepping for today. Trevor, we need to chat. Maybe he took a walk. His automobile is still here. My automobile is missing. Perhaps he took it. My phone is not working. My automobile is gone. Perhaps Dad took it. He cannot be driving. Both. Whose ugly automobile is it? In front of the home. My phone isn't working either. That jerk shouldn't have terminated my phone. Let's go check if Cindy will allow us to use her phone. Tom returned to the house. They made a tactical error. I secured the entry locks. They were now out of the house with no functional phones or credit cards. They wore no identification because both of their purses remained in place. I had no misgivings after feeding both driver's licenses into our paper shredder. I know it's petty, but I'm sure it'll make them uncomfortable as they try to rebuild their lives. We are filling my shot glass. I turned on the television and watched a few minutes of a corny, feel-good show. Our scenario could not be more different from this iconic, heartwarming show. Sitting in silence was a better option. Michelle and Allie returned to a commotion at the front door. Michelle's daughter, whom I no longer claim as my mine, comprehended what was in the garbage sack on the porch. Allie said, oh my God, this is everything I have in my car. Daddy got rid of my automobile. The cello didn't buy it. He would not do that. That's simply not something he would do. Mom, 
Perhaps the reason your automobile is missing is that he sold it too. I will kick him if he does. I adore that automobile. The doorbell rings every two seconds. It was difficult to understand all of their back-and-forth chit conversation. I had two females with holiday-painted claws, so I'd be a fool to open the door. Michaela was angry. Trevor, please open this door right now. It's freezing outside, I yelled back to them. Mitch, the keys to your new car are in the ignition. The orange and green Malibu parked in front of the house is your vehicle. Everything from your old vehicle has been moved over. I've been advised that the heater takes a bit to warm up. It has a full tank of gasoline. Perhaps you could offer your ass to Max and crash at his house. He's probably still hot for you, someone yelped. Okay, he knows the other one. Trevor, let me explain. Was Michelle his clumsy attempt to continue the conversation? After a few seconds of silence, Michaela tried a softer tone. Trevor, I am sure you can hear me say something. Merry Christmas, Mitchie. Get out of here with that kind of daughter. A few minutes later, the old Malibu roared into life. It sounds like it could use a new muffler. Not surprising, given that the guy almost handed me the car to get it off his hands. Continue being healed on my dime. The traders left the house quietly. It had been a long time since I'd heard of anyone dying from carbon monoxide poisoning via their muffler. Maybe I would be lucky. Probably not. An hour later, I saw my father-in-law's phone number appear on my cell phone. We've never been drinking pals, but we tolerate one another. After a few seconds of evaluating my response, I let it go to messages. Hey, Trevor, I have a few of distraught women here. I thought you would be able to offer some light on this scenario. Call me. By the way, Merry Christmas. I put my phone on silent. With some spiked eggnog, I gradually came down from my adrenaline high. The flickering lights of the false tree soothed me into sleep. The sun shone on this bitterly cold Christmas morning. All of the serving dishes were cold on the dining room table, but the microwave performed an excellent job of heating up my breakfast. Ham and cheesy potatoes. Works during the day or at night. There were presents ready to be opened. Santa had not left me anything, as the gifts under the tree had been placed there last night and were scheduled to be opened after supper. Has anyone been paying attention? There was no gift from me to any of them. I did not open any of their gifts. Instead, I gathered the most valuable items in my possession to take with me. Not a single image of either bed made the cut. Any I found were now lying on the ground. It took Michelle many days to find me at my hotel. The sun had set, and a sharp breeze blew. When I answered the door, I left the latch in place. I was expecting another poinsettia sales presentation for some youth sports team. Instead, it was a pale-faced Michelle with no makeup on and her hair done up. Trevor, please do not close the door. I didn't, as I replied. What do you want, Mitchie? An opportunity to explain. May I come inside? No, please. Trevor, there's no reason your neighbors should hear this. What part of no do you not understand? I'm pleased to explain it to you. First and foremost, I apologize. I cannot explain my conduct. What acts are you discussing? Mitchie, thank you, Trevor. Not out here. Let me come in and discuss it. Michaela replied quietly. Having sex with Max. Did you have sex with Max? Doesn't that beat it all? Her eyes popped wide open. You did not know? I guessed, but now it's proved. Actions have consequences. Wait, you were planning to divorce me without providing proof? I guessed correctly, didn't I? Have you found a lawyer yet? I am working on it. But we don't need to divorce. I will do anything to save our marriage. That was a little late. Why didn't you decide to try to save our marriage a month ago? I understand why. It's because you are a selfish person who believes she is entitled and above reproach. You felt you could do whatever you wanted without consequences. Did you inform me immediately? A day later. A week later. How many others were there? Slut. Michaela recoiled from the vitriol in my voice. It was the only time. You need to believe me. One poor decision should not jeopardize our marriage. Which dumb decision? As far as I can tell, numerous cheating schemes may result in a stay of execution. Cheating is simply fatal. Hiding your unfaithful habits ensured that there would be no reconciliation. The worst part was including your daughter. That's correct. She is your daughter. I want nothing to do with her anymore. All of this is on you. If you had kept your mouth shut about what happens in our bedroom, she would not have been involved. I loathe you, God. Some of the neighbors were enjoying themselves while watching the poo show. Trevor, I'm sorry. How can I make things up to you? You cannot. 
I hope I'm better off without you. Perhaps I will be. Perhaps I won't. But it is on my terms. Divorce your cheating ass and move on. Understand? Thank you, Trevor. I understand you're wounded and angry, but please don't do anything for a few weeks. It was only one afternoon. What can I do to convince you? Please leave and never disturb me again. Now, please forgive me. Time has passed and the ball game is ready to resume. Thank you for stopping by. Not. The door closed softly. Michaela begged and knocked, but my noise-canceling headphones did the job. I'm not sure how long it lasted, but she wasn't there in the morning. Twelve months, less than a day later. I sat alone in my one-bedroom apartment, choosing to continue the Christmas Eve custom. After a sluggish start to learning how to cook, I made a modest meal for myself. The expression goes that you are stabbed in the back, but it actually devastated my heart, ego, and confidence. My self-esteem stayed intact. Many nights I worried if I had overreacted. I never agreed with that. I became disposable, so I departed. Case closed. My experience in divorce limbo was that of a beaten guy. I was unpleasant to be around more than once. My manager reprimanded me for snapping at co-workers. I gradually sank into a reclusive lifestyle. My co-workers have learned to leave me alone. I accomplished my job well. Company celebrations took place without my presence. Friends tried to set me up, but I turned them down one by one. My buddies stopped calling. My pity party seemed to go on forever. I took up running. People notice your earplugs and leave you alone, between cooking for myself and my new hobby. I now needed to gain a few pounds. My prior outfits did not fit, therefore I wore a modern style. Occasionally, a single co-worker would compliment me, but that was generally it. The divorce went on for nine months. Once we got there, the house sold quickly. McKella received the majority of the earnings rather than monthly support. Ali and Jeff part ways. Michaela appeared to be comfortable with cheating, but not so much. Jeff. Jeff, after a few too many drinks, cornered me last spring and read me the riot act for introducing him to Heather. It's always somebody else's fault. I wasn't present with Heather. He was not. He was weak, like most guys his age. A seductive siren can entice with little effort. Allie tried unsuccessfully to yell at me. She was a woman yelling at my voicemail. Maybe eventually I'll answer her call, but don't bet too much on it. I neither received an invitation nor attended her graduation. Michaela had particularly difficult circumstances. She hadn't held a full-time job since our marriage. My lawyer dragged the financial issues out as long as he could. When the house ultimately sold, I refunded all of the money the court stated she should have received and all of the upkeep she needed to live comfortably. Mine is also gone. A few attorney conferences... Michaela tried to convince me that she had been really stupid, but it was no excuse to end our nearly 25-year relationship. I stared blankly at her, which caused a few tears to fall. Hate is a powerful emotion, and I can't seem to keep it under control. Twelve months later, we sat in my apartment and carried on the Christmas Eve tradition. Macy is a buddy who is going through the same thing I did. No, we are not lovers. I'm far from prepared for that again. After the dishes were done, Macy took me to the center of the living room where we danced tightly at times. I still miss the warmth of an eager woman pushed against me. After around ten songs, Macy wiped away a tear and went home. We are both damaged goods. Allie's tone varied in the voice messages she sent roughly once a month. She apologized. I never returned one of her calls. My interfering mother let slip that Michaela had moved in with a sucker. It shocked me that my reaction was largely directed at me. I've started making small conversation with folks again. Older employees shun me. New employees. Just think I'm weird. Making friends is difficult for me. However, I was able to bridge the gap with Macy. We are just pals. In late January, Ali sent me a letter. I pondered whether or not to open Curiosity One. There was a brief note in a selfie. Daddy, I apologize for what I did to you. As you can see in the photo, I am pregnant. I was wondering if you had the heart to include a grandchild in your life. If not, I can understand. Love, Ali. The return address was many counties away. Apparently, she had moved. There was no mention of a husband or whether she wore any rings. They were difficult to distinguish in the image. I was torn. I despised what she'd done to my life. Nonetheless, I've always desired grandchildren. It's not the grandchildren's fault that I dislike their mother. It would be some weeks before I responded. In the meantime, Macy and I parted ways. We both realized we were only shoulders to rest on. She chose to relocate far away and begin again, 
with a few lingering hugs. She fled my life to keep from going insane. I started playing pickleball at the recreation center. It's a smaller version of tennis with an entirely distinct set of rules. You eventually wind up playing with folks with similar abilities. It is very junior high school. Click. Shannon came into my life with a boom. She appears to be around my age, as do many of the men and women that play with me. When you're not very excellent, your shots don't always land where they should. Shannon was hit between the boobs by one of my strays. Her female companions ridiculed her, suggesting that she make me kiss it to make things better. I blew many kisses her way, adding to her already red face. Another shade or two. As we were leaving, Shannon teased me after the games were over. The least you could do is get me a soft drink. You are an extremely quiet and shy person. My name is Shannon and your name is Trevor. Sorry for hitting you. That was not my intent. I'm not a good player and an even worse communicator, particularly with women. There is a Jamba Juice in the strip mall. I'll buy you one, Trevor. I'll pay Shannon. Should we walk? Sure. Why not? We learned about each other. Her comments flowed, although mine were not as graceful. Shannon cornered me as the talk carried on. Trevor, I can see you are quite insecure with me. If you don't mind my asking, are you seeing anyone? No, Shannon, I am not. To tell the truth, I'm not sure I'll ever see anyone again. Did she die or leave you? She cheated on me, but I wouldn't. Or because it could not accept it. It's been a few years, and I suppose I'm still not over it. How about you? Seeing someone? No one. Seriously? I go on dates, but that is about all. When was the last time you were on a date? I haven't had a true date since we parted ways. I've had some guests around for supper, but that's about it. When did your marriage die? It was December 26th, months ago. Not really. When I was dumped for a trophy wife, it took me a few years to regain the confidence to try again. The entire chat was making my palms sweaty. Shannon noticed. Let us talk about something else. Why did you start playing pickleball? My pity party was getting boring, so I decided I wanted to do something different. This is how I got started. Two of my girlfriends nagged me until I caved in. I truly enjoy it. How about you? Yeah, I purchased a paddle, and playing has helped me come out of my shell. Well, I have to leave. See you tomorrow. I play at 4 p.m. Sure. It was a pleasure talking with you, Shannon. You too, Trevor. Continue to be patient. Things can only get better. That evening, I felt confident enough in me to respond to Allie. Ali, I am willing to try. You and I will never get close, but I'd like to meet my grandchild. Please notify me when the moment is appropriate. Under no circumstances will I be in the same room with your mother. Mr. Fruin, as Ali indicated in the picture, I expected a May or June delivery date. I'm not sure if Ali saw my reply because she hasn't sent me another letter. The next day's pickleball performance was excellent. Shannon was a flirt, as were a number of the other ladies. It felt nice. Shannon commented after I made an especially good shot. You know, Trevor, you look great in that shirt. I bet you look even better after that. The women giggled as my face flushed. Shannon, it's funny you should mention that. I was thinking you looked great in those yoga pants. I bet they would make you appear much better. Shannon went scarlet red, eliciting hysterical laughter. Then the females began chanting, Take them off! Take them off! I obliged and removed my shirt. Shannon shook her head furiously, waving her finger at me as if I were in trouble. As I put my top back on, a number of the ladies let out wolf whistles. Shannon mouthed, You're terrible at me. I blew her a kiss. Following the games, several of the ladies engaged in some serious flirting. One even joked that she looked great in her yoga pants. Shannon carefully waited her turn to get a soft drink from a girl. I was about to ask you. Nice yoga pants. Quit it. Aren't you very proud of yourself? While enjoying our drinks, I mustered the bravery to ask Shannon out for supper and a movie. I would have died if she had turned me down. She did not. Plus, plus, plus. After being out of the dating world for almost 27 years, I was completely confused, clumsy, and terrified. But finally I was able to relax, and my usual happy personality returned. After several dates, Shannon persuaded me to spend the night. Her question astonished me. Who were you thinking about while we were having sex? I had to pause and think. You. I was curious what you saw in a loser like myself, a mirror reflection. 
What do you see in me? We kissed passionately and made love this time. Shannon invited me when she brought her family and grandchildren over. It felt strange at first. Her children are extremely protective of their mother. Shannon would grasp my hand or kiss my cheek whenever they got agitated. Over time, I became tolerated. Shannon curled up in bed with me in early June. Let's see if you know how to rejoice, grandfather. With my increasing erection in her fingers, I realized what she had spoken. Do you know anything that I don't? Well, there's only one huge hospital where Allie lives, so I've been looking through the baby register. A lady named Allie Fruit gave birth to a girl two days ago. My erection began to diminish, but some warm lips quickly had me ready to ride. Slapping flesh didn't take long. My tongue compensated for my fast climax. The sound of hitting flesh lasted considerably longer. Exhausted, I cuddled Shannon. So what do I do now? Send flowers. It does not have to be all lovey-dovey, but it is important to honor her new motherhood. A day after I sent flowers, an overnight letter arrived. Daddy, I know my apology sounds empty, but it is sincere. I loathed you after that terrible Christmas Eve collapse. You have damaged my friendship with Jeff. You took away my car, phone, and essentially my way of life. I was a bitter, immature lady for a long time, but then I considered it from your point of view. You did not deserve what we did to you. I will never forgive me. I was a nasty individual, but I now have a much better comprehension of what you tried to teach me. I am a very different person now. How could I offend someone who had taken me from crayons to perfume? I cried with sheer evil. This is difficult, but I will attempt. I want you back in my life. I want to experience your reassuring hug at least once more. I need you to look into my eyes as I apologize, so you know it's true. I want to be your friend, a friend who sought to show me the difference between right and wrong, weak and strong. There's a lot to learn. What can I offer you in return? All I could think of was a grandchild. You have a granddaughter called Bonnie after your mother. I'm now at home in my modest apartment, unmarried, so it's just Bonnie and me against the world. You are welcome to visit at any time. If you prefer not to have me there, I can transport Bonnie to you with a diaper bag and a couple bottles. I will always be your daughter. I long for your affection again. Love, Allie. I gave Shannon the letter. She appeared sincere. What are you going to do to keep yourself away from her? She has already damaged one of my relationships, and I value what you and I have. That earned me a warm hug and a sweet kiss. Thank you, Trevor. There's no need to worry. I'm a huge girl who has built walls to keep invaders at bay. I'm not sure how you got through those boundaries, but I'm glad you did. We hugged for a long time, swaying like if a slow love song were playing. You know, Trevor, you can't give me all your love if you still hate them. Let it go. So what we have can expand. Shannon was correct. It was time to leave it in the past. The lights were on in an apartment at Allie's return address, with Shannon looking over my shoulder. I lightly knocked on Allie's door. Her eyes sprang open wide. Daddy, this is a surprise. Come inside. Hello, Allie. This is Shannon. Shannon, this is my daughter, Allie. We greeted her with soft cheek embraces and entered her flat. Do you want to hold Bonnie? I sat at the kitchen table and gently cuddled. Bonnie. She did not cry. I had forgotten how small their hands and feet were. Shannon looked at me tenderly. Shannon broached the subject. So, Allie, you mentioned you are not married. No. Bonnie's father believes I am trying to trap him. We were inebriated and he didn't use any protection. He knew I wasn't taking the pills. Perhaps he will come around. Then again, perhaps not. Allie and I spent the evening tiptoeing around one other. I went without giving her a hug or kiss. As I started my automobile, Shannon scolded me. She needs to know that you still love her. I know you do. You know you do. Go back up there and do the right thing. I left Shannon in the car and knocked on his door. Did you forget anything? Kind of. I neglected to hug you and say I still love you. Hallmark should film a movie about how emotional things were after that. Plus, plus, plus. Six months. A few weeks later, the annual Christmas Eve supper was held in my flat. Shannon and Ali, and I was holding Bonnie. I gave the Christmas benediction. We ate and opened presents. Bonnie received more than her fair share of presents, but she enjoyed the sound the paper made when she played with it, as it was too far to drive on a cold Christmas Eve. I let Allie and Bonnie to remain at my place. Shannon and I spent the night at her residence. 
This had just become a common occurrence. Epilogue. Shannon hosted the annual Christmas Eve supper a year later. We signed a prenuptial agreement before our wedding. When it comes to the other pickleball ladies flirting with me, I keep a close eye on them. I do not mind. This year, we're joined by Carter Dent, Allie's husband and Bonnie's father. It took him some time to realize that he genuinely wanted to be a part of Allie and Bonnie's lives. Bonnie and I are snuggling pals. I enjoy being Papa. Shannon was also joined by her children and grandchildren. One of her sons delivered the Christmas benediction. Life continues, with or without you. It took me several years to understand that life was passing me by. Not anymore. I'm pleased with where I ended up.